My name is Lorna Richardson. I work at Zero Waste Scotland. Um, I'm going to spend about 15 minutes uh, just giving a brief introduction to Zero Waste Scotland, to the circular economy and to this lecture series in general before we hear from the, uh, the main speaker of the evening who is Dr Stafford Lloyd from River Simple. And after his, his lecture, we're going to be joined up on stage by Mark Hilton from Unomia, and we're going to have about 30 minutes for questions and answers. And after that, there is some time for networking, and I am assured that refreshments are provided for that final half an hour. So, um, so I said, I'm Lorna Richardson. I work at Zero Waste Scotland as a programme manager. My team work with businesses across Scotland to help those businesses identify and then realise the circular economy approaches and opportunities that are available to them. So um, we do a lot of work with small to medium sized enterprises across Scotland, specifically around circular economy and what it means for their business. I have um, been forcibly reminded by my comms team that um, social media is the, the, the thing of the, f of the today, never mind the future. So I would encourage you, um, if you want to tweet during the lecture, um, use, please use the hashtag make things last, which is the official hashtag of the Scottish circular economy. So who, are, who is or who are Zero Waste Scotland? Uh, we are... We're a non-departmental public body in Scotland. We're fully funded by the Scottish Government with additional funding from Europe. And um, we exist to create a society where everything is valued and nothing is wasted, which is, you know, not that small an endeavour. But um, what, we want, what we want to do is to work with individuals, with communities, with businesses, with third sector, with the public sector, to really look at how we use resources in Scotland and make sure that we, we extract the maximum value from them. Circular economy is one of those really interesting concepts that people talk about a lot, but it's very difficult to actually pin it down to you know, like a, key, a key sentence or, or even a key paragraph. Uh, this is the diagram that we're using at the moment. So th to, to explain it, the idea is like, at the moment, our linear economy, we dig materials out of the ground, we make something out of them, and then we throw them away. And so we, we're, once that material has been put into a product, it's not accessible to us again. The circular economy is about how can we maintain use of that material and how can we keep that product and its component materials in use and in circulating for as long as is physically possible. So we're looking at uh, the reuse of products, the repair, remanufacturing of, of products. Um, at the end of their life cycle or their lifespan, when they're no longer useful, can we take them apart and um, extract the individual components from those products and then reuse them. So it's all about keeping materials circulating. And you can see that it's really important that we get the design right. If you want to keep a product in use for as long as possible, it needs to be designed so that you can repair it. Uh, there's no point in having a washing machine that, you know, when a, when a bit of it breaks, you open it up and you can't get into that bit to fix it because it's a completely sealed unit. So design is really important. Um, and also, if we want to keep products um, moving and keep them, keep them being reused, we need to look at our relationship with them and the business models that the, the, the manufacturers actually use. So how, do, how can they actually maintain control and ownership of that asset in order to make sure that it is continually reused and recycled? Um, so Stafford's going to talk about, about the, the business model, the circular business models that he's using to help him with his products and services. So why are we having these lectures? Uh, circular economy is, is important. It's clearly um, an idea that is gaining a huge amount of traction that's making sense to us in our world. Um, in a manufacturing context, it's, it's important for, t for a couple of reasons. The first is, if you have a fully functioning circular economy, manufacturing sits at the heart of that. If you want to, to have a product that you can keep in use for as long as possible, then the manufacturing industry needs to be bought into that and they need to be looking at how they design and manufacture those products, how they can take those products back and then remanufacture them. So it is really important. And coming in the other direction, manufacturing businesses themselves are starting to realise the benefits and the, the advantages that can be gained from adopting circular economy business models. And um, there's a, globally, there is a recognition that this really works. And manufacturing industries are starting to look at alternative business models around things like leasing, servitisation, um, 
repair, reuse, remanufacture, and they're generating additional revenue streams from that, which ultimately is the key aim. I always say that the, the main word in circular economy is economy. If it doesn't make economic sense, then nobody will do it. So that's why manufacturers are interested in it, because the ones that are adopting these circular business models are finding that they're increasing their resilience, their profitability, and quite crucially, they're finding access to new markets so that they're, they're being, being able to expand their business and to grow and develop into new markets and new customer bases. Now, in Scotland, manufacturing is a really important part of our economy. And um, the, the future direction and the objectives for our manufacturing sector are set out in the Ma Manufacturing Action Plan, the document Manufacturing Future for Scotland. And that looks at what does the Scottish manufacturing sector need to do in the next few years if it's to continue to grow and develop and to make itself resilient and sustainable for the future. And so the sitting in the Manufacturing Action Plan, there are a number of different work streams that look at different components of the manufacturing process and one of those is a circular economy work stream which we at Zero Waste Scotland are leading on so we're really looking at how can we work with manufacturers to help them identify and embed circular economy principles and these lectures are one of the key deliverables from the manufacturing action plan so um, the aim or the, the intent is to provide a series of evening lectures aimed at industry leaders and to give them access to a range of speakers from um, essentially across Europe and around the world. Um, so people who are at the forefront of innovative change and really driving and developing these circular economy models so that we can learn from them and then we can understand how we could then adopt and use those principles in our own manufacturing businesses. It's a series of five lectures. This is lecture two. So we have Stafford Lloyd with us tonight, who's, who's going to provide tonight's lecture, and um, finishes with the fifth lecture, which is Tapani Jokinen, who used to work at Nokia and is currently looking at how to design the world's first modular mobile phone. In addition to the lectures, we're also developing a series of masterclasses, which we're looking to deliver towards the end of this year. And those masterclasses are one-day workshops which would enable participants to really come along and examine in depth how they can apply circular economy principles to their business and really workshop with industry experts as to what they can actually do and what the opportunities are for them. So um, I would encourage you to both to sign up for the, the other lectures in the series and also to register your interest in the masterclasses on our website and then we'll be in touch when the dates for those are confirmed. But tonight, now, I'm going to hand over to uh, our main, the main event of the evening, Stafford Lloyd. Um, so Stafford is, I have to read this because I didn't memorise it. Stafford is a specialist in hydrogen energy and the circular economy at River Simple. Um, there, he's responsible for bringing whole system design practice to the engineering team and reducing the environment, environmental impacts of the vehicle throughout its life cycle. Um, previously, he worked in the life cycle engineering and systems design at Rolls-Royce. So, I think he's, uh, he, he knows what he's talking about. He was previously chair of the Design for Environment Working Group for the Aerospace Defence and Securities Industry Association. He currently coordinates River Simple's involvement in the Ellen MacArthur Foundation CE100 programme, and he regularly speaks at national and international events on the circular economy, including tonight's event. Um, River Simple is a sustainable car company which was established to make a step change in the environmental impacts of personal mobility by making fuel efficiency profitable. So, um, River Simple has developed a hydrogen fuel cell powered vehicle. Um, hydrogen fuel cells are used within a network electric platform because no other technology offers a combination of efficiency, range and versatility. Um, and they're looking at leasing these, these, these cars, these products, so that instead of actually selling the product, you just lease it. So there's, they don't have a product to sell to the market, which is a really interesting uh, component of circular economy. So I look forward to hearing some more about that. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Hey, hello. Uh, excellent. Well, that was easy. So yeah, uh, so yeah, I'm here from a business that's trying to implement a product service system, as it's called in academic circles, or a service-based business model. So yeah, I've been 
invited to share our experiences of how we try and make these things work and focus particularly on the financial aspects, which uh, yeah, I was really asked to kind of say, right, okay, so how does, the, um, how, does, how does the business case stack up and how do you actually make this look financially? Although I want to give you a bit of a health warning. So we are, st are still a relatively new company. There aren't a lot of businesses who are trying to do what we're trying to do. So I'm probably going to actually offer more questions rather than answers. But at least maybe if we start answering the right types of questions, maybe we're, we're kind of halfway through uh, solving the problem. And also what I want to try and do is we, we talk a lot about, uh, I'm just paraphrasing my boss a lot of the time, um, creating a framework for thinking differently. And I quite like that bit in Lorna's slide where uh, that's what I think a lot of circular business models uh, re requires is, okay, we, we don't necessarily have to do things uh, like they're, they're being done before, we can do things in fundamentally different ways, but it requires just a little bit of, of creative thinking. So I kind of uh, came here on the assumption that most of you probably don't know, have never heard of River Simple or don't really know what we do. So just been given a brief introduction, but yeah, we are, uh, we like to call ourselves a sustainable car company. We have a very clear purpose, which is to provide mobility at zero cost to the planet. We have developed a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle. We only have one at the minute, which is a prototype. Uh, we are a kind of classic TRL 4, 5, Valley of Death company, which is an interesting place to be as an employee. Um, but, you know, we have uh, some ambitious plans. Uh, we quite confident in saying we think we're the only privately held hydrogen fuel cell vehicle. Uh, 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 companies trying to sell or make hydrogen fuel cell vehicles in the world. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's radically efficient. We also think it has the potential to be the most efficient car in the world, or at least the most efficient road-going car in the world. Uh, you know, this is it, this picture, like I say, it's a two-seater. Uh, we do have plans to make large cars, a four-seater, and also uh, a lightweight utility vehicle. This is our kind of go-to market vehicle to kind of get us going, really. Uh, and yeah, and rather uniquely for a, a car company, our aim is to never sell one, uh, which is quite interesting if you're an automotive firm. Um, so as also been mentioned, we do quite a lot of uh, talks at... Um, events because what we do is quite interesting and uh, a lot of the time I don't think people really get the context of what life at River Simple is really like uh, because we are actually quite a small company uh, even though we're trying to do some quite bold things. Um, so we're based in the middle of Wales, uh, literally in the middle of nowhere, <clears throat> a little place called Calandrindod Wells. Uh, this is our little industrial unit, you can just see the car coming out there um, and this is the main office. We actually use uh, upcycled uh, desks that are made from uh, used pallets. Uh, which is quite cool. Uh, but we are quite a talented bunch, so one of my favourite colleagues is a chap right in the middle of the picture. His head's almost obscured by a piece of hydrogen pipe work. But, um, he actually worked on the DeLorean back in the 1980s, uh, which I think is super cool. Um, <laughs> maybe not a good example of making a successful business, uh, but uh, <laughs> they're certainly pretty famous. But yeah, we have guys from all over. We, funny enough, get a lot of guys who've come in from aerospace, uh, automotive, obviously, people from Bentley, JLR, a lot of people from Formula One have come and worked for us. Um, we have three armed forces represented as well, which is quite a nice balance. So we are very small, but um, we are trying to do some pretty big things. Um, but yeah, this is what life at River Simple is, is kind of like. Um, to describe our overarching plan as a business, we like to use our seven point strategy. Um, so I'm going to go through the first three things, uh, mainly tonight, but I'll, you know, if you're interested in other things, I'm sure we can cover it through the Q&A. So we start with our network electric car, which is the kind of heart of our technology, um, which isn't ours. It's actually, uh, you know, it's not something that we, uh, we have intellectual property over. It's actually written in a book. It comes from a place called the Rocky Mountain Institute. I'm not sure if any of you heard of it. A chap called Amy Lovins did something called the Hypercar Project, I think it was in the 1990s, is the main kind of idea behind the car. But that's the core, and that's very closely coupled to, as I'll explain, our business model, which is to sell a service, not cars. We try and avoid the term leasing, uh, as we feel that has uh, certain connotations and maybe tax implications. Uh, so we say we're providing a service, not cars. Um, we have a, a quite an ambitious aim to flow this model down into our supply chain, which we call Sailor Service Upstream, which is also something I've worked on. I'm going to share with you some of that. We, uh, we often get challenged about hydrogen infrastructure. We've also thought a lot about this. 
uh, from a kind of systems perspective. And we think a city by city strategy is the way to go. And we think that's possible and achievable. We're very keen on distributed manufacturing. So Hugo, my boss, is very inspired by uh, E.F. Schumacher, who some of you might have read Small is Beautiful. Um, so he talks a lot about distributed manufacturing. It's a lot easier to do uh, when you make the kind of cars that we, we do, uh, which I can explain in a bit more detail. We eventually have a goal to open source the design, and that's really to avoid standards war, which, uh, being a small company, we're never going to win. Um, and we also are looking at alternative governance structures in terms of how the business is owned and run, which um, I play a role in and is very interesting. Uh, so we like to say that we design at many levels. Um, but yeah, we can go into that a bit more. But uh, I couldn't um, also avoid the opportunity to make a bit of a pitch because we are actually about to open a crowdfunding round. So your support will be greatly appreciated. <coughs> So if you go to riversymbol.com and click crowdfund, you can register for the, the private launch, which I think is going to go live either late this week or early next week. Um, so I thought I'd start with the, I think the kind of key thrust of the talk that we want to focus on, which is the seller service, not cars, and really explain how we see this working and why we want to do it. So the whole idea is, is that rather than selling a car, we provide a service contract to consumers we see it lasting somewhere between one to three years. Uh, the kind of main analogy we think applies is almost to liken it to a mobile phone contract. So you have a, a fixed price element, a variable price element, and it's total cost of ownership. So you not only get the car, but you get your maintenance insurance, uh, but crucially the fuel. And uh, this means that Think about that. If we can then provide that service by minimizing our fuel use, by making a really efficient car, we make more profit. So we, we like to think about aligning interests in terms of efficiency and making a profit. And that's why we've designed the model the way, the way that we have done. So in you know, very kind of technical academic terms, what this does is decouple your profit from your material throughput. So you, you're systemically driven to do more with less rather than making more money by selling more cars, which is what a traditional automotive or manufacturing business is driven to do. So we think this is better environmentally. Like I said at the start, we're a very sustainably motivated company, but it's also better financially, um, which I'm going to go into. So I'll, I'll be honest, I'm not a financial expert. I have done some very basic uh, financial business training a long time ago, which I can just about remember enough of. Uh, and I was also asked to try and keep this simple, but so this is how I see financially the, the kind of benefits of the model working. So in a normal business, uh, if you're, say, a startup, your typical financial graph looks something like this in as much as you have fixed costs associated with, thank you, the operating overheads, I suppose they will be called in a normal business, you know, salaries, the fact you've got a, a factory there is, is going to cost you money. You have variable costs which are linked to uh, the cost of sales, it might be called, you know, the stuff that you make that is dependent on how many, of, how many things you sell and make. And then you have, uh, you sell stuff and you get revenue, and then at some point your revenue uh, overtakes your cost and you make a profit and everyone's happy. So I think, I'll be honest, I'm not an expert, so uh, you could maybe later on uh, help me refine this, but in very simple terms, this is how I kind of see it working. Or I've, I've never tried to explain all this before, but I thought, well, let's go for it. Um, but what happens is someone then goes out and uses that product and there's potential value that can be retained uh, or, or uh, that is lost through that use being um, uh, yeah, uh, undertaken by somebody else. So whether it's the service or consumables that are used in the uh, yeah, usership of that product. And we've looked at this for a car and we think over the life cycle of a car, uh, a typical OEM would realise roughly in the region of 40% of the potential value that could be realised from that car over its life. So they make it and they lose 60% of the value that could be realised from that car. So what we thought is, well, if we wrap uh, a ring around all of the cash flows associated with the uh, creation, uh, you know, the manufacture and use of that car, then we can in fact make a lot more money. So shifting that graph to look something a bit more like this, what you end up is, 
Uh, so one of the key things I should have mentioned, our goal is to offer the service to the market at the, as I mentioned, it's total cost, cost of ownership, but an equivalent price point to a normal car. So most people don't realize how much they spend on their car per month. It's actually quite a lot. I think the AA do, AA do studies that are available online, you can go and find them. And it's somewhere in the region of five to 700 pounds per month if you travel between eight and 12,000 miles per year. So if you think about your cost of your fuel, et cetera, et cetera, we actually think we can go in a little bit lower than that, but that's what we think the roughly monthly cost of our car would be, including everything. But you would just get one, one bill, basically, that covers everything. So if you take your services revenue, it basically becomes the, the cost of usership. You still have your fixed and variable costs, but you get the, the difference between the costs and the services revenue is, is what we call the economic benefits of efficiency. So if you provide everything, it then becomes kind of legitimately in your interest to determine how you can provide that service in the most efficient way, whether that's by reducing the cost of what you make or reducing the cost of uh, the, the usership of the product, which is why we've ended up actually designing a vehicle that will do the equivalent of 250 miles to the gallon, because we get the benefits of that efficiency, even though the customer's playing what they would normally pay for in effect the same functional result, which is them getting from A to B and having a nice car to drive around in. So that is very simply the theory behind the model. However, this is, uh, or doesn't come without its challenges, should we say. So I must admit, it's very difficult to draw these graphs in PowerPoint and make them look like they may truly look uh, <laughs> with it all kind of making sense. But uh, one of the main problems with this is, uh, uh, on the graph, you probably would have noticed it, I drew what is typically called the break-even point, I think. And usually uh, the break-even point in this kind of model is much later than it would be in a more traditional model. So the, uh, I mean, we're looking at uh, probably doubling what an automotive manufacturer would normally uh, expect in terms of a return on their investment, which comes with risk if you talk to management accountants. So somebody quite eloquently pointed out to me when I presented this model in Denmark, you need, problem is you need a shit ton of money to make this work, so where do you get it from? Um, and we don't ignore that fact. We have, uh, you know, obviously very cognizant of it in terms of trying to make the business work. However, we do feel it's possible when you look at the potential money you can make over the lifetime of the vehicle. There are financial institutions that are starting to take more notice of these this types of models, ING in particular, who's a Dutch bank. And we also like to highlight that I think something like 80 to 90% of vehicles now in the UK are bought on higher purchase schemes. So it's not like we're doing anything that's radically beyond what's already done at the minute. It's just instead of, say, I think our initial production volumes were aiming for about 5,000 units a year. Instead of 5,000 customers going out there and taking PCP plans, we're, we're just one company that's taking out a loan on 5,000 cars. So people are used to financing the sale of vehicles, so we don't see why it should be a problem uh, looking at something like asset-backed finance. But it does become tricky when you apply things like discounting rates, et cetera. Um, it becomes quite tricky and it requires a lot of thinking about your, your balance between what is called life cycle cost and unit cost. So it's handy when I used to work somewhere like life cycle engineering at Rolls-Royce because we had to look at a lot of these things. Uh, and, the, and there is a balance. So, okay, so we take an extreme example. We make money, more money by using less fuel, but if it costs us a million pound to make a car, we'll do a thousand miles to the gallon, we could find out that actually that doesn't make any financial sense. So there are limits to, to the benefits of efficiency and it's finding the sweet spot between, I suppose, what are your fixed and your variable costs. And then, as I say, there are risks associated with future cash flows that tend to get discounted quite highly. So in the end, does the risk justify the reward? And you know, this is something that we have to go around and justify um, very frequently. So what I thought I'd try and do is, um, in, in, as I say, try and keep this simple. In simple terms, almost provide a framework of how you would 
think through what value could be realized from whatever product you're making and how that might be realized. I think the key thing to make, I mean, I quite like Lorna's diagram, is the underpinning logic behind all of this is implementing a business model that enables you to get the benefits from whatever value you're creating. And then it's a question of how do you identify and unlock that potential value. A simple example being, if I include the fuel in a mobility contract, how do I get the benefits of efficiency, for example? So I've got a more complicated diagram that I'm gonna show you later, but this is very simple. Uh, it tends to be iterative cycle of looking at what value there could be, looking at does it make financial sense for us to try and ring fence that value as a company and have the cash flow coming towards us rather than somebody else? What are the barriers and drivers and how do we unlock it? And then what's the implementation and how do we actually put this into practice? Now we're very lucky, as I said, I've been to Denmark recently and there's a group of people there who have been looking at product service systems for a lot longer than me and know a lot more about them than I do. So if you're really interested in it, I'd recommend you go and talk to them too. Um, so it's a chap called Tim McAloon, um, who funny enough is from Barrow and Furness, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> um, and he's, he's been studying these for a while and as recently we've jointly published a paper with them that's gonna to go to a conference this year. And when in, in the introduction to that paper, they identified what they call circularity strategies about how you, within a circular economy model, you can identify and unlock new forms of value, as you could call it. And within the paper, uh, we outlined five. So the first one was preventative, examples being efficiency and non-toxicity. And I must admit, the, the third column is my kind of addition, because uh, for me, the main point of this is there's an underlying value creation assumption behind each of these circularity strategies. So behind efficiency is you, you're looking at re basically reducing your cost per, per functional result if that's kind of your miles traveled. You could close loop, so look at recycling or composting, which is in effect getting value from waste, as in loop extending, which could be downcycling, getting energy from waste, or looking at cascading loops, so looking at what other waste flows come out of your product system. Making stuff last longer, which in effect is increasing the revenue per, uh, per unit or reducing the cost of delivering a service. Or looking at intensification strategies, for example, shared use. So this is something we are considering as well, is, is potentially selling our cars or selling our services into shared use schemes because it increases revenue per unit. So the next slide's a bit busy, but what the guys at Denmark have been doing is using a tool called the Circularity Compass. It's actually developed by uh, a lady who did a PhD at Imperial College, you can find her uh, called Fenner Blomsma, you can find a PhD online quite easily and, and read how she got to the circularity compass. But in uh, trying to make, uh, communicate it in simple terms, it's a very simplified way of looking at a product life cycle and resource flows within that life cycle in various resource states, whether it's a material a component or a finished product, and what opportunities exist in terms of implementing circularity strategies that allow you to unlock new forms of value. And they very kindly uh, mapped some of these for River Simple onto their circularity compass as a bit of a test case. I think it's still a relatively new tool. And picking out obvious ones that I've been focusing on, so preventative strategy number two and preventative strategy number three related to internalizing the fuel costs in our business model and then incentivizing us to lower the energy in use. Um, well, actually, I think these are fairly clear and obvious ones, but there's all sorts of other ones that we're looking at that I won't go into in too much detail now, but I suppose the, the fundamental thing is because we retain ownership of the vehicle, it becomes in our interest to extract value from that through life and end of life, is what you could say in simpler terms. So looking at, okay, so if we can identify new forms of value in terms of efficiency, a lot of what we do is underpinned by financial models Obviously, I couldn't really show you too much of one here because a lot is quite sensitive information. But we, we look at various uh, criteria, as you can see here, in terms of the costs of the car, fixed and variable, and revenues. And then we can 
play, play with some numbers and start to understand whether or not unlocking this value actually makes financial sense and if it's something that's worth doing or not. Within this, barriers and drivers generally come to the fore. A lot of the drivers that we find is um, looking at more stable revenue streams. So our, we kind of fantasize about the day where we don't ha actually have to make any cars to make money because in effect, if we've got 50,000 vehicles on the road all on service contracts, we don't really have to make a car to get revenue because they're already earning revenue. It can reduce cost barriers. If you're looking at life cycle costs instead of unit costs, you can potentially make something that costs more to make, but in the long term is going to make you more money. It does make your customer relationships, uh, I, th I think it improves them. You, you, you inherently become closer to your customers and it unlocks the potential for innovation. But there, there are some really surprising things that crop up, particularly around policy and legislative barriers that we, we've been a bit shocked by on the odd occasion. One of my favorite examples I mentioned about upstreaming uh, into the supply chain. So we're actually one of the companies we work with made tires and we were really keen on using remanufactured tires on our cars. And they said one of the problems is, is even though remanufactured tires pass all of the type approval tests, it's actually illegal to put a used tire on a new vehicle. So basically they said you can't do it. Or they said what you could do is what they do in Italy, where I can't remember which company it was or exactly what they were making, but they got around this by homologating vehicles with a new set of tires on taking the new tires on, putting the remanufactured tires on the car and then giving it to the customer. Uh, so I think the Italians have a, a much more creative view of EU regulation, but there you go. <laughs> but there's all sorts of things that crop up. Inevitably, I th usually the main barrier is cash flow. As I say, you need money up front and you're gonna get payback over time. And as I say, that comes with risk and, it, and it's hard to, uh, it's hard to get people to part with their money, I suppose. And a lot of the time, actually, simply lack of awareness, which is why we do a lot of talking at conferences about how cool this is. Then in terms of unlocking the value, so one of the other key messages we like to highlight is how you generally can't look at your business model and your technology independently. They're inherently coupled. And in order to unlock the value, you generally need to change the product. And again, working with suppliers, this is where the penny really dropped when they understood the difference between operating a service model and just simply leasing, which is, in our minds, just a route to selling the same thing in a different way. Uh, we say, fundamentally, if you're offering a service model, your design incentives change and the product that you give us will change. And that's when the benefits, benefits of it really came to, to the fore. So as I said, our car, it will do the energy equivalent of 250 miles to the gallon but it will still give you the same performance as a normal vehicle. It'll do not to 60 in 10 seconds and comfortably cruise at that speed. It's a 300 mile range uh, and it weighs about the same as the battery in a Tesla Model S. Um, and I mentioned the powertrain, which is our key, uh, kind of the key part of our model and is the technology. And we use something called the network electric architecture, which say came from hypercar project. And the main innovations this implements is decoupling energy and cruise demand, if I'm not getting too technical, but if you think basically when you drive your car, the majority of the time you're just cruising, tootling around, you're not really pressing the accelerator too much, it's about 80 to 90% of the time. You're actually using around 20% of the power the engine can output because the engine's being sized for accelerating and going up hills. So 80 to 90% of the time, you're basically driving around with an engine that's four or five times bigger than it needs to be which we think is a bit stupid. So we're like, why don't we separate them? So we have a fuel cell that provides what we call a maximum constant demand, and then a bank of supercapacitors that provide a boost of power when you want to accelerate or go up a hill. And that means that we can have a car that will do not 60 in 10 seconds, but cruise with a fuel cell that's eight and a half kilowatts, which is about three kettles. So that's not bad. And that's how we can achieve 250 miles to the gallon equivalent. The other innovation is having a motor in each wheel, which means we can brake on each wheel and recover that energy, which makes it even more efficient. And then we implement something called mass decompounding, which uh, because we don't have anything identifiable as an axle or gearboxes, all of this stuff carries weight, which means we can end up making a car that's a lot lighter than a normal car, which again saves us energy. 
And then when it comes to implementing it, the, the popular method of choice for developing these type of business models, developing these, these new types of business models at the minute is to do a pilot. And that's what we're planning to do. So, and this is why we're doing our crowdfunding round or what we're principally aiming to fund is to run a, a trial of what we call beta testers. So we're, we're currently making a new batch of vehicles that are gonna be beyond prototypes, but not quite the finished article. And really, really the aim of this is not to test the technology, it's to test the new customer value proposition that we're offering to the market. Understanding things like price point, because usually people kind of wince a bit when you say five to 700 pound a month, but that's less than you pay for a Volkswagen Golf or a Ford Focus or something like that. So, um, so that's our aim and understand some of the barriers that we've identified to our model through our analysis. Uh, we're actually aiming to get, have 20 cars on the road. We've had about 800 people sign up. We're aiming to run and test with between one and 200. Oh, I would like to point out, we have also thought that you don't necessarily need to do a trial to de-risk a lot of these models. There are, and we've sat down and done this kind of thought about actually what, what are the barriers? What do we need to overcome to implement this model? And what's the best way of uh, finding the information we need to know to answer the questions or, um, yeah, or, or, or kind of de-risking the whole proposition. So there is a, I think there is a tendency to do pilots, but I wouldn't necessarily say it's the best way. I'd, I'd think a bit more creatively about actually what is it you need to know or, or need to find out. So as I said, uh, one of the other things we're working on is trying to flow this model down into the, into the supply chain. So very early on in the... Uh, in the kind of development of our business, Hugo realized there was a disconnect between our incentives as a mobility service provider and the incentives of our suppliers in still selling us the components that we use in our car. So uh, in basic terms, if we buy fuel cells from Acme Fuel Cell Co, uh, their interest is still to sell fuel cells to us and they make more money by selling more fuel cells, which means even if they promise us that our, their fuel cells are going to be efficient and long-lasting. There's really no systemic incentive for them to make them efficient and long-lasting. So we thought, well, if we actually go to Acme Fuel Cell Co and say, well, we don't actually want to buy your fuel cells, we want to uh, know, pay for the energy output from it, for example, it aligns interests and, again, it, it, it allows us to identify new forms of value that we can almost co-create and get the benefits from. So we thought, let's go upstream with sailor service. And this is, this is where I started, because I'm fairly sure um, no one else in the world has tried to do this. I met one other company in Denmark that is, again, is exploring it, but I haven't seen any example of any company trying to work upstream with its suppliers rather than offer new service models to the market. So there wasn't a lot out there in terms of how do we actually do this. A lot of senior people in the company at the time actually thought it wasn't possible. Uh, so they told us forget, to forget about it, but we thought, well, no, let's try and give it a go. So then fortunately for me, Innovate UK came along and they ran a competition called Circular Economy Business Models that um, was aimed at feasibility studies. And they gave us some funding, which is very kind of them, a relatively small amount, but it, it enabled us to make a start in terms of how do we actually approach our supply chain and say, we don't want to buy stuff from you anymore, but we're still gonna make cars and we want stuff. So the objective of this was to develop a, a plan to pilot one circular business model with one of our suppliers. And I'm gonna start with uh, what actually came out of the end of the project, because one of the other outcomes I wanted from this was a better sense of how we actually do this. Because like I say, we, we largely started with a blank sheet of paper. So this is probably a messier version of the diagram that I showed you earlier. It in effect communicates the same information. Um, so it's about well, where, where we started off was looking at who in our supply chain might be interested in taking on a service and business model or brainstorming opportunities for value creation in the supply chain. So for example, one clear opportunity that we identified was focusing on the fuel cell. So a fuel cell has platinum in it. It's a reasonable amount. It's, a, it's about the same amount in, in the size of fuel cell that we use that actually goes in the exhaust of a normal car. And we thought, well, 
there's a lot of value to be retained in making sure that platinum gets captured at end of life. So we would say, right, well, it's worthwhile speaking to our fuel cell supplier about how we can potentially develop a model to unlock that value and, in effect, share it. So then we would do a bit more background research and develop something called a value proposition, which is really the key to unlocking all of this, is you know, where is the value to be retained and, and how are we going to implement a model that enables us to capture that. And when you look at service models, there's generally a spectrum. I've seen people have said there's eight or six, varying from a very basic model where you still sell the product, but you have, for example, like a fixed price service contract, which then incentivizes uh, on a maintenance or remanufacture or the capturing of, of some of the kind of value, all the way through to what could be called a pure functional result, which would be paying even per mile. I mean, ours is what you call a use-based product service system because we still hand the car over to the customer and they're paying for the use of that car. A pure functional result would be they simply pay us for miles traveled and that's it. So you can develop all kinds of value propositions on this spectrum. We then negotiate these value propositions with various suppliers. In the end, we we identified upwards of 10 companies where we thought an intervention could be worthwhile and actually spoke to the company and they said, this is something that we're interested in exploring. We feel like we, we, we come a long way. I mean, in the beginning, Hugo, my boss, commissioned a study looking at this about 10 years ago and I think half the supply chain just turned around and said flatly, no, we're not going to do it. But we didn't get any, any pushback, um, at least ultimate no's. Um, so yeah, we developed about, I think about 10 value propositions, negotiated about six of them. In the end, we managed to agree one, which was for the, the tie supplier, for which we developed a financial model and a plan for implementation. So uh, yeah, that was uh, yeah, a much messier version of, um, of what I showed you earlier, but what I was kind of inspired by. And I must admit the feasibility study was interesting because we did feel like we did some good work, but we went around in circles quite a lot. Um, and unfortunately, the, the Thai company got taken over by Continental, so uh, we couldn't really work with them anymore. <laughs> Again, that's a barrier, uh, potential for takeover. Maybe it's one to add to the list. But we still feel like it was a worthwhile exercise because we have a better sense of how. It was a feasibility study, and the answer was it's feasible, although. I'll probably say it's one of the most challenging things that I've, I've tried to do is start with a blank sheet of paper in a really small company with zero leverage and try and actually negotiate with suppliers about how we don't want to buy their stuff anymore. Um, <laughs> it was certainly an interesting exercise and I got a few uh, raised eyebrows, should we say, uh, with particularly with sales directors whose time I might have been wasting, but anyway. Um, as I said, the, the getting an idea of how we actually do this I think was the main benefit and it struck home even harder at this point how key it is to couple what you're doing with your business model with your technical development. One of the good examples we, we came across was we use electric motors in our wheels. They use quite sizable permanent magnets, which are made from neodymium, which is a rare earth metal. Some of you may know, and we thought, potential value, value retention, let's talk to these guys. And we thought we naively assumed it must be relatively easy to recycle the magnets end of life, or there must be something that they do with them rather than just throwing them away. But that's literally what they did. Uh, they would smash the magnets out into a form that they couldn't largely couldn't be reused, and they go off as mixed waste. And we thought this is insane. They were like, "Well, yeah, this is great, but we're going to have to completely redesign the motor." And do you have any budget for that? We're like, "No." And they're like, "Well, neither do we." So we're we're at an impasse um, <laughs> yet. And I mean, I suppose this goes on to uh, one of the underlying messages from this presentation as well, is it, it, it leads to fundamentally more collaborative ways of working because you can't go to a supplier and discuss what value could potentially be retained from you using their component unless you're pretty open about what, what the technology is, the nature of the business relationship at the minute. And, and, we, and we're, we're, you know, we're, we are quite open, or we were quite open, in that we think there's value here to be made. It's going to be a question of we can only realise this if we work together and in the end share it. And we, we think we probably will end up working open book with a lot of suppliers 
because in the end we will both make more money by doing it that way. But it is, it is fundamentally more collaborative. So we thought, well, let's look for some more collaborative programs within which to develop this model. So we are looking at a whole powertrain development program. So as I said, we're, we're TRL 4.5, so we, we need to do all the hard stuff to get our product to market in terms of making it safe, making it reliable, and be able to make it at the cost that fits with the fixed cost in our own variable cost within our model. So we're, yeah, we're currently seeking funding to get through this technology development step but one thing we managed to convince the potential funders of is that we need to couple this technology development with the business model development. And all of these potential collaborators who are going to provide us with our fuel cells, motors, and all the things in between are really excited about the potential to develop these new models and implement not only new technology, but new technology coupled with new business models. So the outcome of that is not only going to be all our components ready to take the car to market, but value propositions for all of those um, agreed and in place, which I thought was a bit of a coup. Another thing we're looking at, I'm not sure if any of you guys have heard of a company called Elvis and Cressy. So they upcycle, or they started up by upcycling used fire hose into high-end fashion items, basically. I think they're a really cool company, and they call themselves environmental designers. They, they look at various other things as well. And what we're working on with them is a system whereby you can um, take what is in effect waste leather offcuts from the automotive industry, turn them into panels that you can stitch together to make a car seat. And then when you sit in the car seat, I imagine only certain proportions that are going to waste. I'll probably guess it'd be roughly, uh, we kind of wear away, so it'd be roughly, I don't know, 20% of the whole seat cover. But because they've got these panels, you should be able to take it off, unstitch the ones that are worn, stitch in new ones, and have a what is in effect a new seat cover, but with an 80% reduction in resource use. So this is something we're trying to develop with them, uh, with a business model that's going to incentivize and benefit from that reduction in resource use. Another thing we're looking at, so we, um, so our car is very lightweight. We plan on using a lot of composite technology, which is a very famous end of life, uh, or presents kind of very famous end of life issues, and they're fundamentally very difficult to recycle. So we are working with a company that's developed a thermoplastic composite, which basically means you can melt it apart and recycle the elements, with the structural properties that we can use in the car, and also using bio-based inputs, so we're looking at using flax. So again, they're very excited. They're looking at developing this new technology and see the opportunity of developing a new business model as an enabler of bringing this technology to market, which I think is one of the main benefits. So I'm just going to cover uh, two more overarching points that I like to focus on when talking about service-based business models. So the first, I've talked about uh, changing the nature of the customer relationship, but it, it really does, and this is something that we really want to exploit and leverage to our benefit. I don't know about you guys, but when I go and buy a car, I usually feel like I've just met this guy, and I walk into a showroom and feel like I've been a little bit fleeced. And we, we want to fundamentally change that dynamic and, and almost become friends with our customers and, and work uh, according to... Uh, yeah, where we all have shared interests in terms of giving them what they want in, in, in a way that uh, works for them and works for us. Uh, and I think it's actually really exciting. We, we do a lot of service design work, which was a phrase that was new to me until a few years ago. But actually looking at how we design the service, customer experience apps, you, know, it, it, you can basically rip up the whole automotive model of selling cars and deliver something to market that's fundamentally different. And I think that's really exciting and, and one of the most exciting aspects of our model and what we could potentially do and do away with chaps like this. And the other is, one, one of the, the big things that we get asked about, I think, is the Internet of Things and Industry 4.0, a really big mega trends, and they're like, well, how is this related to your model? And, and, and again, I said, the business model and the technology are coupled, and you do find that, I mean, it's, it's almost like common sense. If you, you're retaining ownership of a product and providing a service, you need to understand how that product is performing. Uh, it's, you know, there's a reason why Rolls-Royce, since 
rolling out their service model in the 1990s and invested lots of money in what they call engine health monitoring. Because if they're on the hook for that service, they need to know what that engine is doing pretty much all the time. And that's what they do. They have these sensors and they, they beam back this data. And how we apply um, what you might call more start, smart technologies is to make the car more efficient because that's what is in our interest. So we think it's actually a, a, a truly smart car because overarching all of our hardware, there's an what we call an energy management algorithm that actually monitors what the driver may want in terms of the vehicle speed and altitude, and then controls the energy flows within the powertrain according to that driver demand. So the car actually knows where it is, how fast it's going, and manages the energy, energy within the powertrain according to, that, to, those, to, those, uh, to those kind of attributes and design inputs. And we like to say, you know, this gives you everything you need and often you don't. And is, is, I mean, I say intelligent mobility, to me sometimes is almost a bit of an oxymoron, but anyway. Uh, but this, this is truly intelligent mobility because it's helping us do things more efficiently. So one final point, which is my kind of like one of my favourite phrases, and I've never really explained the, the background of how I got to this conclusion, but innovate or die used to be one of the most popular phrases. I think it's Peter Drucker, there's various sources that have, uh, as a source of this. But I think we're, we're getting to a point in the 21st century where we really need to be innovating business models. And, and implementing business models that enable us to make a profit whilst reducing environmental impact, I actually think is the key challenge. And from our experience, at least, to implement a new business model leads to fundamentally more collaborative working relationships. So for me, innovate or die is dead. And the new, the new model is collaborate or die. And uh, that's really simple. question actually to kick us off and I'm sure you've all got lots of questions but um, there's one that, that was interesting me and uh, as a, a former Land Rover owner uh, which is always a kind of love-hate relationship if any of you have owned a, an older Land Rover in particular but you you kind of form a, a bond with the vehicle that relates to many hours spent maintaining the vehicle actually but anyway um, in this case that won't happen obviously but I was interested in the, the sort of life expectancy of the vehicle and, and issues like that around how you keep the customer satisfied. Obviously, the relationship uh, tries to be a much longer one. And so, you know, how do you build in kind of upgradability and, and all those things that will allow you to move with technology and keep the customer satisfied? Uh, with great difficulties. <laughs> no, I mean, we have thought about these things. So our outline plan, which is as yet untested, so I will let you know the results of the beta test, is uh, so a typical average car in the UK, I think, has a life of 13 years. So we think the cars will be on the market somewhere between 10 and 15 years, roughly, is what our models are based on. And over that time period, we expect up to five customers will potentially have service contracts on that vehicle, which will last somewhere between one and three years, nominally. Between those, we expect there to be upgrades, but we do accept that later customers are in effect taking on a second-hand vehicle. So our model builds in a cost uh, reduction over time. So when customer number five comes to take on the vehicle at 10 years old, the price becomes competitive within that end of basically the second-hand car market. So we have thought about that, and yeah, we don't expect people to pay £500 a month for a car that's 10 years old. Uh, it feels a bit cheeky. We do acknowledge in between there will need to be upgrades, so having things like uh, easily remanufacturable seats, body panels that you are made of composite because they're lightweight, but that we can take off and easily repair or replace. Uh, and not having those uh, kind of go to landfill is, is obviously important parts of that. It is, I mean, one, um, I mean, people get really excited about this. I mean, take one of the suppliers who's going to work with us on the, the powertrain project that we're developing. Uh, they make something called a DC to DC converter, which we need in the powertrain. And uh, within five minutes, the guy said, well, actually, there's only one component that's going to break within 15 years. The rest of it will pretty much last forever. And it'd be really easy to make our converter such that you can just take that out and put a new one in. So you could get 
the, you know, the, the value from two worths of DC, DC converters with you know, a fraction of the resource use. So they were like, this is brilliant. You know, this, we should be able to make a lot more money from this, which is what it's all about. And again, it's about fundamental design, isn't it? And talking to the supply chain about how the design needs to change to, yep. to fit in with, with your model. Uh, anyway, should we uh, pass it uh, open to the to the floor? Has anybody got questions? Perhaps lady here in the in the green. Hello, um, I'm wondering if we could talk a little bit about the ecosystem that's required in order for this to be successful, which is a bit like opening a can of worms, I'm sure. <laughs> but one of the ones that came to my mind was, you know, a big limitation to hydrogen fuel cell cars going on the market today is the, the hydrogen fuel stations being yes. available. Yes. So are you going to go out and <laughs> start planting hydrogen fuel stations or how, how do you plan to get around that? Um, <clears throat> So we are at the minute, I mean, uh, I'm actually, one of my jobs is to manage the installation of a hydrogen fuel in Nabucco Venue for our trial, but that's something we're not intending on doing for the whole model. So I suppose a couple of things to highlight. One, we are cognizant of the infrastructure challenge. One thing we like to highlight, because a lot of people are very uh, keen on electric vehicles at the minute, which is really easy because you can just go home, right, and plug it in and it's fine. We're like, well, that works when you think about one vehicle, and if you have one hydrogen vehicle, it's really difficult to refuel because about the cheapest refueling station you can buy costs about a quarter of a million pounds. So you're like, well, this is a massive problem, but if all of a sudden you think there's 30 million cars in the UK, so think about now trying to implement the infrastructure where 30 million people go home and plug in their cars and the, the power stations you're gonna need. Um, but actually, you could create a national hydrogen infrastructure for somewhere in the region of five billion pounds. So I've just got a nice little reference. That's equivalent to what the government is planning on spending to maintain the Houses of Parliament. And you could create a hydrogen, national hydrogen refueling infrastructure. It's orders of magnitude less than what it would cost, just take a look at the cost of Hinkley Point, to create enough electricity to fuel or to power all of those EVs, um, let alone, I think we've roughly estimated, say roughly 48.3% of households we think it wouldn't be practical for them to have an EV because they either live in a terraced street or in a block of flats. So we think the hydrogen infrastructure challenge is there, but we think it's surmountable. And we don't think hydrogen is the only answer. We think it's gonna be a mix of both technologies. Um, but yeah, in, in essence, we think doing it city by city is a sensible way to go. So we don't need to sell, because we use a carbon fiber car and the economics of carbon fiber manufacture, very different to steel manufactured cars where there's very high capital costs associated with making steel cars. And you make a very small margin on a lot of vehicles where the capital costs associated with carbon fiber cars are much lower. So you can basically make, break even on a lower volume of cars. So we could actually make 5,000 vehicles and turn a profit. So you could go somewhere like, we actually want to avoid going to London first, but like the, you know, the Southwest of England, like look at like Bristol, Cardiff, Newport. There's gonna be more than we think, more than enough demand around that area to put in a nascent hydrogen refueling infrastructure, you could, you know, like I say, the range of the car is 300 miles minimum, could be more quite easily. So you could drive enough for you to drive a week, you visit the refueling station once that's strategically located. And we think there's a practical way then of in a targeted manner, building a nationwide infrastructure rather than taking a punt on building a nationwide infrastructure that costs you five billion pounds, but no one's gonna use because no one's got a hydrogen powered car, right? So it's a bit of a chicken and the egg situation. So we're like, well, why don't you put the chicken and the egg in the same place at the same time? And then I suppose the, the other benefit uh, to us is because our car will travel, so our car will do roughly 200 miles per kilo of hydrogen. <clears throat> the Toyota Mirai, which is a Toyota car, I think it'll do 60 or 70, which makes us much less sensitive to the price of hydrogen. So that's obviously, um, it, it lowers the barriers to entry for the infrastructure providers because we can create a market and we're not that bothered about making the hydrogen cheaply, which can be a barrier. They say it's expensive. We're like, well, it's expensive if you can only do 60 miles per kilo. If you can do 200 miles per kilo and you look at the outcome per mile, it's cheaper. So uh, that's another benefit of making efficiency profitable. This is our kind of tagline. <laughs> My question's about your addressable market. 
I know for a fact that Ford, Volkswagen, GM all have rooms with cardboard cutouts of the families that are going to buy the cars and the money sits with the marketing team, not the engineers. So what does your room with cardboard cutouts look like? Who's going to want or desire the vehicle? You may not have touched that but on this presentation, oh, no, we, but no, I assume you do have yes, something like that. Yes, we do. Uh, yeah, so I'm an engineer, so I, I tend to focus on the work on business models. So, <clears throat> so our car was designed by a chap called Chris Wrights, who used to be head of design at Fiat 5, uh, or he designed the Fiat 500, he used to be head of design at Alfa Romeo. Um, so he put a lot of work into identifying who our target customers were and designing a car that we felt as a go-to-market strategy. It's not going to be the only car that we make made sense. So we do have, I must admit, I can't remember they had all these kind of cheesy titles like kind of eco-conscious consumers and all this kind of stuff. Um, but we, we're targeting, I mean, we like to call it a local car. So it is the second family car, everyday run around type market, which, I mean, it would be, I'm biased, it'd be an ideal car for me because I spend 99.5% of my car, uh, time in my car, I'm on my own and I'm traveling to and from work or to and from the gym or to and from the supermarket. Every now and again, I drive a few hundred miles to see my family, but most of the time I could drive a two-seater car and what I really hate is spending money on fuel. So if I could have one that's really efficient, I'd be really happy. So it would be a perfect car for me. Um, and I mean, this is why we think the local infrastructure strategy could work because you could literally draw uh, a 25 mile radius around my house and my car barely leaves that radius. So if there's one refueling station within that radius that's convenient for me to get to, I don't have a problem with there just being one refueling station that can, where I can get my hydrogen from. So that's, that's the theory, and this is why we're doing a beta test, because it's these types of things that we really want to understand. Is this a real barrier to adoption, or isn't it? Uh, so the one refueling station local car model, you know, we think there's sufficient interest. So in a town like Abergavenny, we've had, which has a population of 10,000 people, we've had 800 people register. So we're like, we, we, if eight people registered, we'd have enough customers, you know, then extrapolate that to the whole population of the UK for us to make more than enough money for us to be happy. So, you know, that's, uh, so we think it's not a bad start. Um, Elsa Jean, University of Strathclyde. Um, from a sustainability point of view, we want to um, reduce the need to travel. So, and from your point of view, if we use your car less, there's less wear and tear. So I was just wondering, obviously we need accessibility. So I wonder if there's a, in your business model, there's a way of, of incentivating the less use of the car, which is good for sustainability, <laughs> and at the same time there's less wear and tear for your car. So it's something, yeah, we've played about with, uh, and this is why there's a fixed and variable price element to the model. And then it's where we landed because, I think in the, end, in the very beginning, we were just going to have a fixed price, but then somebody would, or was it even a variable price? I can't remember one, of the, one way or the other, but it, say if you just had a variable cost element, I'll go out and get one, wouldn't pay anything, and it'd sit in my drive and go, like, oh, look at my fancy eco car. You wouldn't drive anywhere and we wouldn't make any money, so that's kind of a bit of a problem. So it's, I suppose it's about finding a balance. And again, maybe picking the right target market. Like I live in a place where it's physically impossible not to have a car. I would love to use public transport, cycle to work, which is what I did when I lived in the city. But where I live, I just can't. You know, there's two buses a day that don't go anywhere near where I want to go. So I need a car. So, you know, as I said, we are sustainably orientated. And I lived without a car for several years because I didn't need one. So it almost sounds odd in that we're not we're conscious that we're promoting car use, but we don't think it's practical to say there's going to be a world with no cars. I think cars are always going to be part of the transport mix. So what's the best way to provide that necessary service and the vehicles that are associated with it? And we think the model that we have is uh, a pretty good stab at answering that question. I'm not saying it's the only answer, but it's, it's a decent one. I'm Izzy Erickson, Zero Waste Scotland. Um, it was a really interesting talk. I suppose I'm interested in how long it's taking you to get to this point. How long you think it's going to take you to launch the vehicle into the marketplace? Uh, good question. Uh, so 
my boss, Hugo, he, so this came out of his MBA project that he started in 2001. So he's been working on this for 17 years. I'm not saying it's always going to take that long, but um, as, as, as well as we always like to say, things will go as quickly as capital arrives. So we're, you know, we still are quite a startup type business. I mean, I'm not sure. I think Dyson took not far off 20 years to get his first model to market. So I suppose there is precedent. So that's how long it's taken us to get to where we are. So we think if, so we need, we need to run a technology development program that's two, three years and set up a factory. We think if we get enough money to do what we need to do, we can have cars on the road, basically the beginning of the next decade is what we're aiming for. But it's a case of getting the money to do that is the main challenge. So if anybody, or well, you can help us through crowdfunding, or if anybody knows that we don't actually need that much. So I think uh, Dyson's spending 2.5 billion pounds on his EV program. The 1% of that will be fine for us. <laughs> Maybe somebody should have a word, but anyway. Could I ask a, a supplementary question? We can have a whip round later on, I'm sure, for River Simple. But um, I was just thinking, it, it struck me that you've started from absolute scratch, you know, as a startup company, having to develop the business models, deal with the supply chain people that you hadn't dealt with previously, and all of that. So would you say that um, it in theory, would be a lot easier for established companies that have already got uh, a developed product that they can then, you know, reorientate in this sort of way by going from a, a linear model to a, a more circular model. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there's probably there's a nice, nice little kind of uh, chance there to make the, make the pitch. I mean, we actually call our car the, the Rasa, which is from tabula rasa, which is Latin for clean slate, because ours has been literally designed from a blank sheet of paper. I mean, you mentioned JLR, so we, I actually know people who work in the sustainability team at JLR quite well, and we converse every now and again, and we have this debate. And I obviously haven't worked at Rolls-Royce, and I'll be quite open being frustrated at the inertia within that business and the lack of appetite for moving to what I see as the future in terms of low-carbon technology. Uh, I think it's actually really hard for established businesses to do something radically different because it's, it's almost like trying to turn a ship. Um, and you, and you, yeah, you don't get uh, this level of innovation. Uh, I, yeah, I don't know why. Uh, I mean, I'm not a kind of organisational theorist, but it's yeah, they they, they find it's, it's too much for them to buy off and chew. You know, you're not going to sell your cars anymore. You got to lease them. And I mean, having said that, the automotive industry is slowly catching up. So I think the head of Daimler recently said they were going to be a mobility provider, not a car seller, which was uh, you know, a bit you know, good news to hear. I mean, I have my own theory. I think this is what some enlightened businesses are doing. So like JLR, so they have their startup, I think it's called InMotion. I think a lot of the bigger businesses are realizing that they can't innovate sufficiently within their existing structures, bearing in mind the current trends of uh, more circular economy models, more service-based businesses, uh, digitally enabled businesses or technology. So what they're doing is spinning out completely separate entities that in, in the end might actually disrupt the existing business. So I have this kind of phrase, disrupt or be disrupted. And I think that's what a lot of the more enlightened businesses are doing. So people like Unilever, I think Marks and Spencer's are looking at it as well. And yeah, they acknowledge it, but they also acknowledge that they can't be radical within a, you know, a kind of existing business structure. I think it'd be interesting to know, wouldn't it, how given the, the movement into car financing and most of the, the big car companies now actually make most of the money through the finances and the add-ons rather than the actual sale of the, of the vehicle itself. And so they've kind of gone part of the way, which I think you alluded to earlier, but they haven't gone that next step, which is what you're trying to do. You know, the, 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 the sort of lease financing side of it is there. But I wonder to what extent for Jaguar Land Rover or any of the others, you know, how that has then fed back into the design, you know, as to because they're now more interested in the longer term life of the vehicle and the financing benefits around that, you know, does that then feed back into the design and the way they think about the car in the first place? Um, I think JLR more than other big OEMs. I mean, I could have given another version of this presentation that's quite scathing of the automotive industry. <laughs> if you look online, you might find some of them. Um, I think they're better than most, but it's still something that they struggle with. And I've made this point to them, as I've probably mentioned several times today, that 
you, you can't just do a new business model, you've got to change the car. And I think a lot of their existing thinking was we're just going to do a service model and it's still going to be the same XF that we make at the minute. And that hadn't really hit home. Although they are doing some really good work. I'm not sure there's, they uh, did a project called the Real Car Project where they're looking at a closed loop aluminium recycling system. Uh, because they, 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 I think they pretty much pioneered or one of the pioneers of aluminium chassis, which is easy to recycle. So uh, they're better than most, I would say, but they're still, it's, I think it's still sinking in. They've got that Land Rover heritage, which <laughs> was a Meccano kit with, uh, built on a, a massive great steel chassis. So. Yeah. yeah, a friend of mine wants to make a hydrogen powered one, so maybe you two could work together. <laughs> It's, it's, a, it's a point. It's a point we like to highlight. <laughs> well, yeah, pre-financing the Model Three is pretty impressive, right? I mean, it's pretty much what he did, wasn't it? <clears throat> Hi, uh, my name's Ian McKinnon. I'm interested in the courage you have to take on the inertia and the suppliers for the collaboration. Uh, that one out of six that you gave as an example of the outcome of your feasibility study. Um, I've tried to that engagement where you're taking established companies um, who will be your suppliers who are needed really to have the financial covenant to be able to support your financial yeah. model. Yeah. Um, they have a model that works for them and you come up and you suggest that something could work better for everybody and they say, why do we make any more money? Why are we going to commit money, time? And therefore you are left really with nowhere to go if they are the, the suppliers or part of what's effectively a cartel. Yeah. Um, there'll be a number of them. And then when you come to all your, all your proposal, it sounds great, it ticks a huge number of boxes, and that's the what. But when you come to the how, it's really, really difficult yeah. to overcome that inertia. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't matter how good your arguments are. And you, you, you mentioned, uh, um, uh, you know, cars of the future, back to the future. Uh, as I understand it, it was built in Belfast with huge amounts of government money. Um, <laughs> and that, I think, is where you have to, to look at is, this is more a societal good than a, 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 a commercial one, and you have to pump prime the development that you're going. Yeah. You're saying there's five billion to put in a hydrogen network. I think they're putting one in California or something, which is miles ahead of us, miles yeah. away from us, miles yeah. ahead of us. But at the moment, we've got hydrogen, which is fantastic, um, but it sits behind the, the electrical vehicles, yeah. uh, and you're, we're trying to set up a, a, a network to allow charging so you don't have to get home because everyone's fear is you're going to run out of park <coughs> right there. Um, so I, I hear you say you've been 17 years, and I think it sounds fabulous, but having actually thought that I could convince everybody to give me money, uh, it's really, really hard because they've got somebody's money, they're investing it, they want returns, and unless it comes from a grant fund arrangement, uh, I just see frustration. Yeah, I mean, I mean, having said that, one of the things that really uh, kind of irks us is, so the big OEMs still get a lot of government uh, money from government, and we're like, you know, JLR, a popular example, they on, you know, typically turn a billion pound profit per year. We're like, why do these guys need government subsidies? But they get them. So, uh, yeah, funding the automotive sector is not something new. You know, it's a kind of um, a bit of a jewel in the crown, I suppose, for UK PLC, whatever they want to call it. So, yeah, we, yeah, we don't hide from the fact that it helps if uh, well, yeah, private money follows public, right, if it's leveraged with public funds. We still think there's a business case to be had without it, but it helps. Um, yeah, and it's it's just a case of, say, just a case of attracting capital, and you you got to put out your arguments, and it comes down to money. And in the longer term, we think we make more, and it's future proofed. I mean, going back to the working with suppliers, I mean, one key thing we really hit upon is where you're working with suppliers that are highly commoditized. It's really appealing because they all of a sudden have a means of differentiating themselves in a very crowded marketplace. And it was the, the suppliers who were more towards the end of the scale. Or like I said, the cash requirements are high, so the Thai company we work with were family business. So they were quite cash rich. So it wasn't a problem to them to use the money they had and invest it to get a return over time. 
Whereas if you talk about a highly leveraged business, then it could be, or business is already highly leveraged, then it could be. Yeah, um, I was just wondering what will happen to, actually, I, I, one is a statement, the other one is a question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just wondering in my mind what will happen to um, manufacturing companies as against re-manufacturing companies. Um, because, you know, when computer came on the scene many, many years ago, where everybody was thinking of a paperless society, and we still have the papers around today, although very much reduced. So if manufacturing companies fail to go secular because of the changes, the cost of changes you know, that's involved and all, all of that, and they die, what will happen to the workforce? I mean, they come back to the society and then you know, it's a problem. That is one. My main question is, um, the, the women collections you mentioned, yep. yeah, how do you get them okay. and <laughs> what kind of women collections are you really talking about? Is it the bags, shoes or? All sorts. All sorts. Yeah. I mean, going back to the, the employment question, so I actually think remanufacturing has the potential to lead to higher job creation it, rather than replacing jobs. Because I think it almost fundamentally it requires more labour input to remake something. I mean, at the minute, the, the traditional in our existing economic system, the focus is labour productivity, not material productivity. And what a circular business model does is actually turn that on its head and say the focus is material productivity, not labour productivity. So, I mean, these things would be helped through the right fiscal incentives. So for example, if we started taxing materials and energy rather than labor, which has been talked about in academic circles for decades, but you know, try and get somebody in government to mention it and they'll probably get shot. Um, so I actually see it as, um, I mean, I, I encourage you to look more into the circular economy. I met a really interesting guy last year called Alex Lemiel, who's been peddling his idea called Circular 2.0, where he replaces the traditional circular economy diagram uh, where it has a product life cycle in the middle to where it has a human. And he, he kind of says, we need to put people at the center of this model. And uh, yeah, I think um, you know, we, well, speaking personally, we certainly see this as an opportunity for creating more meaningful work through reducing, so yeah, you need people to repair stuff rather than just throwing it away and using machines to make more stuff from new materials is what we're looking at. There's also a chap called Walter Starhell who pioneered a lot of these concepts in the, even going back as far as the 1970s, even back then he called it the performance economy. But he talks about material input going down and labor input going up. Because people are like a renewable resource, right? So it makes, it makes sense. This is in our current system, they're more expensive to employ. Um, which is a shame. So, uh, yeah, and Elvis, well, just Google it, Elvis and Cressy, you'll find their website, and it's not cheap, is the only thing I'd say. <laughs> but, I mean, uh, you know, they're targeting the high end of the market, but they, they have some nice stuff. If I didn't already, ha already have a nice bag myself, I would have bought one. But. Um, could we just touch on the consumer attitudes that you've... Um seen so far and any resistance to the sort of the change in what would be required in order to take on the sort of model or what sort of subsets of the population seem most keen to to be on board with it middle-aged blokes um what did you say <laughs> middle-aged white men oh. <laughs> from our studies uh oh, sorry being a bit uh, a bit cheeky there <laughs> <laughs> so um we do actually, we get a lot of vitriol thrown in our direction, which we think is a bit unfair, from certain parts of society that we like to call the Teslarati. Uh, so people who think EVs are going to be the future and hydrogen's a waste of time. Um, but yeah, apart from that, we, uh, we, we generally get um, a lot of positive interest. Yeah, yeah, from looking at the people who do sign up for our trial, for example, it generally does seem to be older people, um, and they typically are white men. I don't know why, that just seems to be, I think it's, 
uh, we also have a disproportionate number of people with an engineering and scientific background interested in what we do and our model, which I think is probably down to the fact that we do promote our technology quite strongly, uh, rather than the benefits of this to, uh, to other people. And this is also why we want to do the trial, because you know, we want to test what we're offering with a broad spectrum of people to see if it works for them. Or, uh, I mean, one of our ideal aims is to almost co-create the service with trialists. So rather than saying, well, here's a service, we say, what do you need from a service like this? So I mean, it's not, I mean, we are, we're almost filling a gap that sits between a PCP, which is how most people buy their cars nowadays, and a car club. You know, we're not either, we kind of sit in between. Um, and I think it, you know, it creates more, uh, more opportunity to do fun things with customers. So, you know, what, you know, we talk about having experience centers where they can go along and have the car washed and have a coffee and learn a bit more about hygiene technology if they wanted to, you know, all sorts of things that we could potentially do. Apps, um, gamification of driver experiences, all these sorts of things. So, um, yeah, but that's, that's principally why we want to do a trial. Time for one more question, I think, yeah, and then we'll have to, to wrap up. One, two more. Oh well, maybe two more. <laughs> two <quick. laughs> Thanks very much. Thanks for your, your presentation. Certainly got the, the cogs whirring and thinking. Um, I suppose two questions. Um, the name, where where the num com name come from? What's that about? <laughs> and the, you're, you're talking about the, the employment point that was raised about um, human beings. Yeah, uh, uh, um, obviously plenty there and growing population. How, how do you see it, certainly within, say, the European context of if there's more people needed, how do you, you then stop that element being offshored to third, party, uh, third world countries, that kind of thing, as has happened with a lot of manufacturing in the UK, yeah. specifically textiles, etc. How, how would you see that impacting? Okay. So the name uh, is actually, so he's now, uh, is actually, I think he's just turned 18, but Hugo's son came up with it when he was eight years old. <laughs> and uh, so some of the, so the river bit is to do with, so going way back when, that used to be how people got about. So in terms of a basic form of transport, rivers as humans is what we used to use. And simple is one of our kind of design principles in that we want things to be as simple as possible, but no simpler. So uh, he said river simple, and I think he kind of stuck. Uh, I must admit, some of us feel it's a bit clunky, but anyway. <laughs> and we get called all sorts of things, Riverside, River Sample. Uh, so which, um, I've actually been to conferences where we've been introduced to staff from River Sample, even though it was on the slide in front of them, but anyway. Uh, and in terms of the offshoring part, so we, again, feel this is another benefit of a, running a service business in the and also run, having a remanufacturing model in that if you, you're looking at remanufacturing things, it, the, in theory, it's a lot easier to onshore remanufacturing. It's a lot more difficult to send something to China, get it remade and send it back. Or that's incurring an, an extra cost when your incentive is to reduce costs. So one of the reasons why we are getting interest from government funding bodies is they see this as a strategy to stop offshoring. Because if we're offering service models and remanufacturing stuff, there's really no incentive to send it off to somewhere else to get it remade. Uh, because we need the material here. And I mean, there always will, in any system like this, there always will be losses. Cars will get crashed. You know, you never get 100% material closed loop. You always need a virgin input. So it's not like we're saying there will be no primary materials coming into the system. But we just hopefully see them being significantly reduced. Hi, um, Graham Douglas uh, from We Solutions. I'm interested how um, rigid you are to your sales model um, versus the technology. I mean, for example, if the Welsh government came along and said we need 2,000 cars, you know, uh, for our runabouts for the, the whole country, um, but we must own them, uh, what would your attitude to that be? Um, Fine, if they're willing to pay the fixed price element. Because, <laughs> I mean, one of the benefits of our model is that we can offer a car to the market because it uses a fuel cell and they're not as developed as internal combustion engines, they cost more. So we can offer a car that's more expensive to make at a price point equivalent to 
a car that's cheaper to make because we're interested in life cycle cost, not unit cost. So, I mean, I must admit, I don't think Hugo is quite pr principled, so he'd probably say no, but me being say, well, if it gets us the cash, then fine. <laughs> I'll probably say, fine, if you're willing to pay for it, but it's going to cost you more than what you're paying for your existing vehicle because it's not designed for that model. So it's going to cost you twice as much. Right. Well, um, we're, we're a little bit over time, but I think that's a reflection of how interested everybody is, and it's been a really interesting uh, discussion. So before we uh, finish for drinks, there's networking and drinks uh, outside. I'd uh, just like to thank um, Stafford in the, in the traditional way by putting your hands together. It's been really great.